survive from one week to another. And to talk about the subject of origins. We're in quarantine and I think this time's, I mean, this time we spent at home uh, allows us to reflect a lot on very deep questions. So why do you think the question of origins is important? Is important to talk about? Is important for an apologist? Well, I think it's uh, important because I think everyone, one, I think everyone's trying to figure out where did we come from. You know, it's funny. I think there there's still a lot of people out there who actually believe that the universe is eternal, in spite of the evidence that shows that the universe had a beginning. Um, Stephen Hawking said that the universe had a beginning. Uh, Edwin Hubble, the guy that the telescope was named after, discovered that the universe had a beginning. Uh, astrophysicist, uh, I think he's an astrophysicist, I know he's a scientist, uh, Robert Jastrow said the universe had a beginning. Uh, I think he's a Russian cosmologist, Andrew Vilenkin, says all the universe, all the evidence that we have says the universe had a beginning. So basically, all the evidence that we have, according to scientists, says the universe had a beginning. So if the universe had a beginning, then it had to have a cause. Scient atheists say it was nature that brought it into existence. But if nature didn't exist at one time, then how can nature be the first cause of the universe if nature did not exist? So I think that's an important question to address. Um, and I think every, every religious person, every worldview, every person, I think that's a big question that everyone is trying or tries to answer. Where did we come from? Exactly, that's what I was thinking about. And I always like to go back to the four questions postulated by Immanuel Kant, because I find them so all-encompassing. Uh, and the questions sound like that. What can I know? What do I have to do? What can I hope for? And what is a human being? And I think the last question, what is human being, can encapsulate the first three. Because once you know where you come from, where you're going, and who you are, you know your identity, you can answer all the other questions. I mean, what are the limits of my knowledge? What can I do in this life? What is the meaning of my life? So I think every person watching and every one of us had a moment where we asked ourselves who we are, why are we here on this earth? So I think it's very important. It's strictly correlated to also what you said, the beginning of the universe. We don't know how the universe began and therefore we don't know who we are unless we know about the cause that gave, mm -hmm. uh, brought everything into existence. Uh, yeah. And I would like to ask you just a side question. What is your favorite argument for the existence of God? If you think about the ontological argument, the contingency argument, if you have something of your own? I think the uh, ontological argument is a pretty solid argument. Uh, the moral argument, you know, um, I think is a good one. I, I, I don't, I can't say that there's any, I, I would say it's a lot of different arguments brought together. It's, I mean, the um, ontological one is probably one of my favorite ones. Uh, if a maximally great, if it's possible that a maximally great being exists, then um, a maximally great being, being does exist. Uh, um, and then there's the argument, um, everything that has a cause, not everything has a cause, but everything that has a cause has a beginning. The universe had a beginning, therefore the universe had a cause the cosmological argument. So honestly, I, I, I would like to say that all the, I, I like all those arguments. So yeah, I think you take all those arguments uh, and put them together. I think it makes a pretty strong philosophical argument for the existence of God. For sure. I was thinking uh, several years ago while I was engaging myself in apologetic debates, mm -hmm. I really like to use this, this argument that I came up uh, with myself and uh, I was just thinking about bringing this up and asking what you think about it. Uh, because in my conception, all notions and all human concepts that we have, have an empirical basis. Everything that we create has to do with something that we experience ourselves or somebody else experience, or we have some uh, record from history. But the only two uh, concepts that have no empirical basis 
because nobody really had direct contact with these concepts, are the concept of God and the concept of eternity. And it's very interesting because these two concepts, they stand out as being infinite. And infinity is a concept per se that is very hard to imagine that our own mind can produce, our mind being limited. So I think that argument kind of disarmed a lot of people that I, I engage myself in apologetical debates with. And uh, I wanted to ask you, what do you think about it? It kind of, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I think it's it's very uh, close to the ontological argument, but it's more personalized. I like it. I think it's good. I think it could have a. I think it has its place. I mean, I think all those arguments have has its place. Um, just knowing when to use the argument, but no, I think it's a good argument. Um, so I mean, I've never thought of it that way, but I think it's a good argument. Yeah, at least it worked in the, in the debates because people didn't really have a good answer or a good reply to that. So I guess, yeah, just like the ontological argument, it's very hard to to find anything that stands against it. Well, you'll get like, well, with the ontological argument, there's this uh, argument that uh, a lot of uh, atheists will parody. It's, uh, well, if a maximally great pizza exists then a maximally great pizza does exist. And I think uh, William Lane Craig talks about that fallacious argument that it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous argument because we know that a maximally great pizza doesn't exist. You know what I'm saying? And what's your definition of a maximally great pizza? I mean, it's just, so I, I think uh, over time an atheist will try to find some kind of uh uh, counter to any argument, regardless of how good it is. Exactly. I think it's uh, the same as the uh, ubiquitous argument that I do not believe in God because I do not believe in Santa Claus. Uh, yeah. I think you're very familiar with that. Uh -huh. We hear that very, very often. Um, so another question that I had is, what do you think about Big Bang? Because it seems like if we polarize the the cosmological explanations of, of our origins. There's the Big Bang theory that everything uh, came from nothing and nothing exploded at some point. There was just a point in the universe and time space that was super concentrated, exploded. And from that, everything that exists today came or we have the creation uh, worldview. Uh, and which is very interesting because I would like you to elaborate uh, a little bit on how Christianity stands out compared to other religions or compared to other explanations that might come from naturalism. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think we can take all world religions in one box, including naturalism and put Christianity in a different box. As Christianity is the only worldview that explains the origin of the universe as created by God, that we're intended by God to be here for a purpose. All the other religions, if we even if we go back to Enuma Elish, I think the Sumerian mythology, everything has this evolutionary, um, um, this this concept of evolution, uh, in the sense that the world came from this cosmic dust or came from something, or in the Greek mythology, gods came from something else. It's like a primordial soup. The yeah. Christianity, on the other hand, I think it's it's the only religion that stands out and that it explains creation in a radically different way well i uh actually happen to believe in the big bang and just know who banged it if that makes sense yes i mean when it says in the beginning god created okay well if there was nothing and he brought everything into existence there had to be some kind of causal activity that caused everything to just kind of come into existence so to me that big bang that whatever that was at that time had to be massive and uh i don't think that the big bang is separate from uh creation i mean you uh if you look at the uh frank turk goes into into really good detail about this. I wish I could remember all of it, but you can see the remnant heat 
from the Big Bang still out there in, in the universe. So I, I, I think some people, mainly Christians, I think, get confused when they say, when they hear the word Big Bang Theory and then creation. I, I think that's the same exact thing. If nothing is here and God speaks it into existence, there's going to be a massive explosion. And it's going to, you know, it's, like I said, I believe in the Big Bang I believe that I believe it happened, and I believe God is the cause of that big bang, and brought everything into existence. And so, I that, that, hope that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think we should make another episode and talk about Genesis, the Genesis account, mm -hmm. and why we should take it as a historical book. And I think we can go on and on uh, to the science of it, because I think people get lost very often in uh, trying to explain to themselves how that actually happened. And trying mm -hmm. to find natural causes and explain it by natural processes. We have mm -hmm. this uniformitarian worldview. We try to interpret the past through the prism of the present. But I think it's logically uh, imperative to assume that everything had a supernatural cause. Yeah. It, uh, um, I've never... Well, I'm okay. If you look at the Big Bang... And then you look at everything else. It's it just it just fits, you know. And then when you read the lines in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's no way that the Big Bang, in any way, in my opinion, um, is in any kind of a contradiction or or does it oppose the creation story in Genesis one. So, I mean, and then like, uh, was it hey, Frank Turek has a really good video on YouTube. I think you just, if you just type in like Frank Turek slash, uh, what is it? Uh, creation or, or the second law of thermodynamics. He talks about this, but, uh, Edwin Hubble, I think he was like the, one of the first people to discover the, the remnant heat variations meaning like you can still see the heat left over from that big explosion. So it's observable. So it's not just, it goes beyond just a theory now. I mean, it's actually observable. You can actually see it. And so that to me is it's consistent with the creation story in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then when he said, let there be light, I think that's when that bang exploded, that big bang exploded when he said, let there be light. I could be wrong in that, but I think that's when it possibly happened because it had to be a massive thing. I mean, just I, I, I can't even fathom it. But yeah, I, I don't think that the big bang, I might be repeating myself, but I don't think the big bang, I think the big bang is very consistent with the creation story. Yeah, if we, I think uh, it is. But if we try to redefine it as big bang, the way God created the universe out of nothingness, nothing being the building block of the universe. This is one thing that both theories, the uh, let's say the, the naturalistic Big Bang, what people, uh, scientists claim that Big Bang was, uh, and the Christian view is that we know who the creator is. There's a mind and an intellect and an intelligence behind it. Uh, but actually the how the universe was created, it's, it is a part of, what we call historical science and it's very hard to go back and really know how that happened mm -hmm. and uh, as you said if it was a supernatural cause it's it's very very hard to even uh, pretend that we can get to at least some bits of uh, of the circumstances at the time yeah but yeah indeed it must have been uh, an awesome event in history oh yeah a massive one so yeah that's uh, that's interesting I would like to to keep this topic of the Big Bang for the next episode that we're going to have probably it's not going to be the next one but uh, from the next episode we're going to talk about Genesis I think you also wanted to to do that about the historicity of uh, oh, especially yeah. those two chapters because that's a really hard debate and it unfortunately splits Christianity today's uh, today um, it does and it's very very controversial uh, so 
just to go back, because I would like to concentrate more on the philosophical part of the question of origins. Uh, and I think Ravi Zacharias mentions that, that nothing bears the reason for its own existence in itself. Yeah, yeah he says that. He's... Like, yeah. No, sorry, go ahead. No, if you would like to elaborate on that. Well, yeah, he says that nothing explains its own existence. And if I'm quoting him right, he says, wherever you see uh, intelligent, you know, intelligibility, you find, you know, wherever you see intelligence, you find intelligibility behind it. Meaning that uh, nothing explains its own existence. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, you look at my my phone or my watch, I mean... Where every design implies a designer. The design argument, I think, is another good argument. You know, uh, the watchmaker. A watch implies a design, a designer, I mean. So, um, you take a, my, like, I, like I, you look at my, like my iPhone sitting right over here. If I was walking through a jungle somewhere, I was lost, and I discovered an iPhone sitting in some mud somewhere, my first thought wouldn't have been, I wonder how many millions of years it had taken for that to evolve into an iPhone or into this thing. I mean, it's just, you just, you just don't think that way. So I, I think, honestly, I think that, the, back to your, I think one of your first questions, I think the design argument is a pretty strong argument. I mean, sure. you, you, I mean, just every time you look at everything, just you see a designer in just about everything. The jacket, the shirt that I'm wearing, the uh, the door that's – is that a door in back of you, that brown wall? I mean you could see that somebody had designed that. It didn't just evolve there. You know what I'm saying? So I, I think that yeah. the design argument is a good argument. I think uh, it's not my original idea. It's been quoted so much, especially by creationists, is that – it's such a paradox nowadays that we're looking for intelligence in space and we're trying to explain our origins, sometimes going to the extremes, trying to find extraterrestrial life and trying to explain how that was brought onto Earth. And then we evolved from that and we're looking for any sign of intelligence in space. And we forget that we have the most amazing um, proof of intelligence if we look down into a microscopy, which mm -hmm. is the DNA. And the DNA is the most amazing and the most complex uh, system and code with an entire language. So we have mm -hmm. so many chemical components that bind, bind, are bound to each other. And they basically create this language, this inner language, in, which creates a code. And the code creates, I mean, dictates who we are. And that is a just definite sign of intelligence. It's like looking into a book and having letters and words put in sentences in the most coherent way possible. And then you write a story. And I think we can all read how complex the DNA is because it's been trying, I mean, people have been trying to decode a scientist and apparently it's decoded, but it's actually not. So these things are so evident. Is, as the Bible says, there are, these things are made evidence ever since the beginning of the world, so we are not without excuse. Yeah, that's but true. I think what, what lacks here is... What, what do you think lacks? What do you think people lack most that they they fail to recognize a creator God when they look at the creation? I don't think it's a, a lack of evidence. I think that it's more about suppressing that evidence. I was listening to a, a what was it a some kind of a lecture by uh, Lee Strobel, the guy that wrote the Case for Christ and all the different uh, series, the Case for Faith and. He had quoted um, a professor named Thomas Nigel. He's apparently he's the leading philosophy professor at uh, New York State University. And uh, he says this. He says, I'm an atheist. And he says, what bothers me, what troubles me the most is the most well-informed and well-educated people I know are religious people. He says, it's not just that I'm an atheist, it's that I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be that way. So I think when you really get down to the heart of the problem, it's 
it's moral, not intellectual. I have had a lot of conversations with a lot of different atheists. And the longer I spoke to these different individuals, the more it became obvious for the reason for their atheism. It was moral. If there's no God, I can define morality on my own terms, and I don't have to be held accountable to anyone. I can determine, I can choose for myself what is morally right and what is morally wrong. And I can change that. If my feelings change, if I decide I don't like this anymore, I can, I can change that. Very few atheists that I have talked to, and they, I, I probably maybe put them more in the category of an agnostic, um, I think maybe one or two, it ended up being, you know, an intellectual thing. They, they, they wanted one, one atheist I spoke to said, I would love for there to be a God, but I just don't believe there is. But I, so I would say without repeating myself over and over, I would say the problem isn't a lack of evidence. It's more of the suppression of it. More of a lot of these atheists just don't want there to be a God. Do you also think that maybe sometimes there's also a lack of uh, just understanding logics and the, the laws of argumentation and how you build arguments, the, for instance, the laws, the law of non-contradiction, that sometimes you just cannot put things together or maybe some intellectual laziness. A lot of people, I think, they tend to find a lot of comfort in their daily life, in their daily habits, and they just suppress these things. As you said, they suppress them, but also they don't really... They fail to recognize that the logic behind it, that you cannot go on, that this effect has a cause, which has another cause, which has another cause, and then you end up with an infinity of causes, and then it just doesn't make sense that everything that exists today has an infinity of causes. If you take it, a look at every single entity in the universe, because that's how we would work based on naturalism. Everything has a cause. Uh, yeah, I think you, I think you're right. I do. Um, mm -hmm. I know somebody, um, that, uh, I know somebody personally that, uh, is an atheist. He was, uh, married to my aunt on my mom's side. And I remember at my dad's funeral, he walks up to me out of the blue, he had this smile on his face kind of. And he said, you know, Justin, you know, I'm an atheist now. And I thought, what a bizarre thing to say to somebody at a funeral. I says, so mm -hmm. what are you, I said, so what are you saying to me? He says, well, I'm an atheist. I said, I said, okay, so what are you saying? He says, well, you know, it's just atheism is true and everything's random and meaningless and there's no purpose to life. I says, if that's true, that also applies to this conversation. <laughs> and I walked away. <laughs> I didn't give him a chance to respond after that. Uh, I did have some time to talk to him a few months later, and uh, it was the exact same thing. I, I, with with almost like you know what you're saying, but it, it boiled down to a moral decision. And he says, "Who? Who? How did he say it?" He said, "Why does God have to have the right to tell us what's morally right and what's morally wrong? I should be able to dictate my own life, what is good and what is you know bad, and that kind of thing." Um, and so, uh, that, uh, with that being said, I think that is the biggest problem with, uh, with atheism. Uh, it boils down to, to morals. And so that's where I think a lot of Christians will run into trouble, um, when talking to the atheists, um, is I think the arguments that Christians should learn is they should learn the moral argument. They should learn the ontological argument, know what it says, and know how to to you know articulate it. Uh, the uh, design argument, one of my favorites, and even the contingency argument. Why is there something rather than nothing? There are things that exist contingently, and there are things that exist necessarily. Like this phone that I have in my hand, it exists contingently because Apple decided to create it. Uh, numbers exist necessarily by necessity of their own nature. They exist. They didn't need an external cause. And then the uh, cosmological argument, I think, and uh, learn these arguments so that when you're speaking to an atheist, um, I think 
the one thing with atheists is they like to accuse Christians of being intellectually stupid or intellectually dumb. Um, and so as a result of that, they think Christianity is dumb. And so I think that uh, it's time for Christians to kind of just, you know, change that, that and show them that Christianity isn't stupid. You know what I'm saying? There might be some intellectually dumb Christians out there, but you can find that in any group. So, I mean, you know, so it's just, I think, it's just kind of my thoughts on that. Yeah. And also the, the question of origins is strictly correlated with the question of identity. And I think that's if the humanity goes through a, a crisis, that it will be a crisis of identity today. I think everybody's craving to stand out, to be unique, uh, to know who they are, actually, and how to, knowing who you are um, makes you know what you have to do, what you can do, and what you can hope for, going back to Kant. So as Christians, how do you think we can engage based on the question of origins and talking to non-Christians? Well, I think this, this is, this is something that's been on my mind for a little while. One thing I see Christians doing that I think they should stop doing, okay? Um, as an old friend of mine, he's a pastor, he said, don't be a sniper with scripture. You've got to stop throwing that verse out there, out of them that says, only a fool says in his heart, there is no God. Well, yeah, that's true. But stop throwing that at them. Learn how to have an actual conversation with them. Learn how to dialogue with them. And the only way you can do that is by learning some of these arguments and learning what atheists actually believe and why they believe there is no God and learn to actually talk to them. When you throw that verse, when Christians throw that verse out at them, only a fool says in his heart that there is no God, as if they've somehow checkmated them and, and it, it, I think it's honestly I think it's ridiculous I really do um, not only that it comes across as hateful yes that is true I believe that's true yeah a fool does says in his heart that there is no God but that doesn't mean that you have to use that as your tactic to talk to them because if we're supposed to win try to bring people to Christ um, you need to learn how to take the time to actually talk to these people and learn how to and, and, and one of the greatest tools is to learn how to listen and to listen to what they say. And so I think I'm getting a little off topic here, but um, I think that's one thing that Christians need to stop doing. Yes, I know there's a lot of, you know, militant atheists out there. And sometimes it's hard to talk to them. Trust me, it is. I've, I've talked to a lot of belligerent militant atheists, you know. And at that point, that's where you just got to walk away from the conversation. Just, okay, they're obviously not interested. If they're like um, just wanting to steamroll the conversation or, or, mm -hmm. or you know, dictate the conversation, then that's where you just got to leave the conversation. Yeah, it's very you know? important to, to recognize when the person is open to the truth. They're open to, to the conversation itself, but they're just trying to provoke you. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, it's almost... One thing I wanted to elaborate on is, so when you use that, when a, when a Christian uses that verse, only a fool says in his heart that there is no, no God. It's almost like you're attacking them and calling them a fool directly. I mean, basically, it's what it, basically is what it is. It's like you're just implying, well, you're, an, you're a stupid fool. You're an idiot because you don't believe in God. Um, but then the atheist can turn around and say, well, you're an idiot because you can't prove God exists. You know, so you, you've got to... One, you gotta you gotta respect them. You gotta you gotta should you should show respect for anybody that you're speaking to, um, because First Peter three fifteen says always be ready to give a defense or an answer to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. And my favorite part comes up, but do so with gentleness and respect. Um, and with you know it, as true as that verse is, only a fool says that there is no God. As true as that is, you don't have to use that. Uh, when you're when you're speaking to them, let them discover that. I guess. Um, but if if a, if an atheist is actually willing to talk to you, then you should be cordial. You should be respectful, and listen to what the atheist is saying and learn how to have an actual dialogue, one that is built on respect. And 
I, I think that if you can do that, I think that uh, you might have a you might have a little bit more success in um, just you know learning how to dialogue with someone that disagrees with you. I think it's very important to create also a relationship or relationship based on trust first, so they know who you are, what your character is, and always keep a position of meekness. Uh, because as you said, I also noticed many times that Christians, they have this, they take this position of almost more superiority towards mm -hmm. the other person, and they, they feel like they're somewhat above, and they have the right to be like shooting straight fire, as yeah. you said. But we should always remember that we are saved by grace, and faith has come as a gift from the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. We know in any way, we're in no way better than the rest. And a lot of atheists, as I said, or agnostics, they're sometimes they're very honest in their pursuit. Uh, they really try to find the truth. They might just be stuck at some point in their life because of some emotions or experiences they had. And this is very important to, to keep in mind when we talk with them. Yeah, you know, uh, to add to that, what troubles me the most um, about a lot of Christians is this. Um, if you look at the average atheist, they are very passionate about what they believe. And they study philosophy and they study science. And they really sure. develop good arguments. They might not be valid arguments, but they develop good arguments for what they believe. And they learn how to articulate that. The average Christian is... Um, Dr. Craig says, is idling in intellectual neutral. The average Christian cannot articulate why Christianity is true outside of saying, I had a personal experience, uh, I have a personal testimony, uh, or they quote, uh, was it Second Timothy? Uh, All scripture is uh, inspired. Mm -hmm. That's as far as they get. Um. They can't really go beyond why it's true apart from that. And so I think that um, that's what's also led to, and I think we're definitely getting off topic. That's what I, this is what I've also believed is what has led to the rapid numbers in people walking away from the faith, especially, you know, that from that age group of like 15 to about 23, 24, 25, especially when they get into a secular university or secular setting like that. Mm -hmm. where they're surrounded by a lot of agnostics and atheists. I think I read uh, about a survey made several years ago at a university in Australia about uh, young people in the first year of college. They did a survey, and 80% of them, they said they were still attending church. And in the second year, out of those 80%, only 12% were still attending church. Yeah, and the main true. reason is that they come unprepared for tough questions. They come unprepared for uh, what is out there in the world. They just base their faith on personal experience, like the comfort of their home, comfortable environment, uh, soft feelings, soft arguments, and, and just Jesus loves you, which mm -hmm. is obviously true, but it's not enough. And when, once they, they, they're confronted with these things, they, they easily lose their faith. They see that there's no foundation. So because we're coming to an end, I would like to ask you, also I want to say that in parenthesis, once we upload these videos, we're going to post uh, in the comment section, we're going to post a series of literature or suggestions that uh, people can can check and, and read. But as a last uh, word, I'd like to ask you, what would you recommend uh, young people watching us now? What should they do if they were never confronted with these questions? They never asked themselves, okay, this is important to know who we are, the question of origins, the question of morality, destiny, um, objective moral reasoning and other things, what should they do? Should they go and start reading? What, what should they do first? I think what a lot of these young, uh, whoever watches this, um, I think a lot of Christians today, now I do realize that there's a lot of people out there that are very passionate about apologetics. I'm one of them, and I'll tell you, I still have a lot to learn, um, which is a good thing, I think. But a lot of Christians out there that haven't taking the time to study apologetics, start studying apologetics. Okay. Um, it is your responsibility to be able to articulate and give a rational defense. There's a meme out there. 
that I honestly, it actually irritates me. And it's a picture of Christ pulling away a, a believer. And it says, I called you to uh, win souls, not arguments. I think that is the most short-sighted meme I've ever read. Especially when you look at Second Corinthians, where Paul says that we are to destroy every lofty argument raised against the knowledge of God. They obviously don't understand what an argument is. It's not uh, a heated fight and you're fighting with somebody. Everything, I mean, if, if, if you said to me, uh, if Ruxander, if you said to me, well, you know, I think I'm going to be, become uh, a, a Hindu. And I says, why are you going to be a Hindu? And he says, well, I just think it's, and you, you give me X, Y, and Z. You're giving me an argument for why you want to be a Hindu. And if I said, well, you know, Ruxander, I don't think X, Y, and Z are true. I think A, B, C, D, and E are more true. And this is why I'm giving you a counter argument. Everybody uses arguments. Um, I've heard Christians say that philosophy is of the devil. And they'll sit there and tell me why. And I say, do you realize you just used philosophy to tell me why you uh, philosophy is of the devil? So I think it's time for Christians um, to stop idling in intellectual neutral, study apologetics, and learn how, as First Peter 3.15 says, give a rational answer for why Christianity is true. That's, that's what I think needs to happen. And when I say why it's true, I don't mean this type of an answer. Well, because he saved me. Yes, Christ did save you 100%, but that's not why it's true. You're telling a person, in my opinion, what you believe. I believe that Christ saved me on the cross. I believe that. I truly do believe that. But I'm telling you what I believe. I'm not telling you why this is true. So they also need to learn the difference between that, why it's true and what you believe. A lot of times Christians will confuse the why it's true for what they believe, and they'll start sharing the gospel with you. Um, and so I think that, yeah, study apologetics. You don't have to go to college for it. There's some one a book that I want to recommend by somebody that I know, Brian Chilton. The book is called The Layman's Guide to Christian Apologetics. You can get it on Amazon for about 18 bucks. It's an amazing book for somebody that doesn't have the time to go to college and study apologetics, but wants to know why Christianity is true, or at least be able to give some basic responses to some of these objections. It's a great book. So hopefully uh, my long-winded answer uh, that is a perfect answer answer to to end this episode. Uh, next time we're going to meet and talk about the subject of meaning, which is going to be very, very exciting. And I hope you enjoy this talk, and I hope everybody from our audience enjoyed this talk too. Uh, and see you next time. <laughs>